This is part one of ELEC 5300, uh, ELEC lecture 11. In this lecture, we'll be talking about two things, or sorry, yeah, two things that are essentially the same, Carhoun and Lueb transformation and principal component analysis. And then we'll finish up by talking about deterministic leak squares. And <laughs> deterministic leak squares will draw a connection back to the common filter and the ideas of whitening. But in some sense, you can think of this whole lecture as really being about whitening uh, because these two things, Carhoun and Loeb transformation and principal component analysis, are also related to whitening. So the Carhoun and Loeb transformation is really just a extension of the Fourier series for deterministic signals uh, to what would happen in the random signal case. So let's start out by talking about the Fourier series for deterministic signals. Uh, and so we know that if we have a signal that's periodic, in other words, uh, it repeats itself every big T seconds, right, then we can express it as a sum of a com set of complex exponentials where each of these complex exponentials, uh, remember, is cosine plus j sine, is periodic itself, and the period is some integer fraction of t, right? Uh, so the uh, period might be t or t divided by 2, t divided by 3, t divided by 4, uh, and so on. Uh, equivalently, we say that the uh, frequency right, is some multiple of 2 pi over t. And so this uh, signal can be expressed as the sum where the weighting coefficients f sub k are known as the Fourier coefficients, and they can be computed by this integral right here. Now, in order to extend this to random signals, the first thing we need to define is what does it mean that a random signal is periodic, right? So remember, there's this idea that, the, well, the signal should be equal to itself t seconds later. So first, we need to define equality. Uh, and we'll define this term here, equality, in the mean square sense uh, by looking at the difference between two random variables x and y squaring it so that it's always positive and taking the expected value and saying, well, if that expected value is equal to zero, then for the most part, for most values, uh, x minus y uh, will be equal to zero, right? And for those values that it's not equal to zero, uh, really they have probability zero. So then with this notion of equality, we can define the idea of a mean squared periodicity just by applying this and replacing y by x at some time big T later. Right. So this is the definition now of mean squared periodicity. Okay, so now assume that we have a random process x of t that is mean squared periodic. And so what this kind of means is that uh, most processes uh, are, are going to be uh, periodic, right? intuitively. Um, we can define the idea of a... Fourier series for the random process, uh, really just saying, well, it the random process can be expressed as a set of um, complex exponentials, right? But now, because of the fact that x of t is random, uh, x of k is random, and then we can ask ourselves, well, what are the properties of x of k, right? Now, of course, because this is a complex exponential, they're going to be complex valued, right? but more interestingly, uh, they're going to be orthogonal. Right. And so remember, the idea of orthogonality is very close to the idea of independence. Right. So in fact, if uh, the random variables are orthogonal uh, and zero mean and Gaussian, right, then that's the same thing as being independent. Right. So now what you see is that, well, we've taken x of t. Right, we've kind of computed a new representation of x of t uh, in terms of these Fourier coefficients. And these are all random variables, but they're all kind of independent. And so now you see this idea of whitening coming up again. So how can we prove that they're actually um, orthogonal, right? And so when we're going to do this in kind of a sequence of steps uh, where we want to first prove that uh, the autocorrelation is periodic, right? And so this should kind of, this result should not be surprising to you uh, because Remember, this autocorrelation Rx of tau really describes the relationship between the signal and itself at a time difference of tau, right? So it's because the signal should be equal to itself, 
um, when the time difference is big T, right, then the autocorrelation uh, should be equal to its value at time zero uh, at time t, 2t, 3t, and 4t. So now in order to prove this, uh, we need to prove something which is similar uh, to the idea of the Schwartz inequality uh, for re regular vectors. Right? So if you remember for regular vectors, what we have is if we have two vectors, so let's just draw, let's say, the 2D plane. And I might have two vectors, let's say this vector here, x, and another vector here, let's say uh, this one here, might be y. And I have an angle between those two, which is given by theta. Right? Then I know I can calculate that angle using the dot product, right? So if I have x dot y, the dot product here, I know that's equal to the length of x, right, times the length of y, times cosine of theta. Right? Where this cosine term uh, has magnitude which is less than or equal to 1. Right? And so what that means then is if I take everything, I square it, and I say, well, this thing squared is always going to be less than or equal to 1, uh, then I have that x dot y squared must be less than or equal to the magnitude of x squared uh, times the magnitude of y squared. Right? And so remember, for random variables, we have this notion of a dot product. Right? That notion of the dot product is uh, the same as is the expected value of the random variable x times uh, y, right? So this expected value of a times b is kind of like the dot product between a times b. And so now you can see, well, this is analogous to this. And so if I just follow through the logic, uh, you can see this is expected value of a times itself, right, which is the squared magnitude, uh, and expected value of b times itself, uh, which is the squared magnitude of b, right? And so because it's a dot product and it kind of satisfies the same properties as in regular Euclidean space, you can kind of expect this to be true, and so we can prove that uh, down there. Okay, so now armed with this idea, let's go back to the original lemma that we wanted to prove about the periodicity of the autocorrelation. So by the lemma that we just proved, Right. I can just say, well, I'm going to define some random uh, variables, uh, A and B, that I'm interested in applying that lemma to. Right. So B will be this thing here, x of t minus tau. Right. A will be uh, the difference between uh, x at time t and the, the, its value um, big T seconds later. And remember, if this thing is kind of periodic, then these two things uh, should be equal to each other. So this kind of A thing should be uh, zero. Right. And so now that we know that this a, expected value of a times b is less than or equal to the expected value of a squared times the expected value of b squared, right? And in fact, here, this is where we use the idea that these guys are zero. Now we've kind of like um, said, well, now this thing, even though these, these two things are not always zero, then I know the expected value of these, uh, the, the square uh, is equal to zero, right? And so now this thing here, has to be less than or equal to zero, right? And what that means then is that uh, if I expand this thing, this this thing out, I get uh, expected value of t plus tau uh, times the expected value. Sorry, expected value of t plus big T times uh, x at time t minus tau, right? Minus x of t times x of t minus tau. Then I use linear after the expectation to get the expected value of this, which is just the autocorrelation evaluated at uh, tau plus t, right? minus the autocorrelation uh, evaluated at time tau. Right? And so now remember these two things are not random uh, anymore because I've re removed all the randomness by taking the expected value. So these are really just numbers. Right? And so if these two numbers um, the difference between them squared is less than or equal to zero, then the two things should be equal to each other. Okay, so now we've proved that this function here, this deterministic 
uh, known function uh, is, in fact, periodic with period t. Okay, so that's the first step. And now we're going to take a look at um, what that periodic periodicity then buys us. Well, now that we know that our x of tau is periodic, right, and this is just a regular function, then we can just apply the regular Fourier, seri Fourier series expansion to this. So we know that, okay, uh, our x of tau can be expressed as a sum of a bunch of complex exponentials, right? And these a sub k's, the coefficients, are complex valued, uh, but uh, we can compute them by from this Fourier integral. Now, first, now the, the final thing we want to prove then is that the coefficients of the Fourier, trans, uh, Fourier series expansion of x of t are orthogonal, and we're going to exploit this idea that we can um, <coughs> express the f autocorrelation of the signal uh, as a Fourier series itself. Okay. So let's take a look at this quantity right here. So this quantity right here uh, is the expected value of x times itself, right? The, or sorry, the, the, the coefficient x of k times x of m complex conjugate. Right? And so this is kind of like the expected value of x times y, except because uh, they are complex values, when I take the product, I have to take the complex conjugate of one of them. But now what I can do is I can actually just uh, substitute in uh, the fact that, well, this is a Fourier coefficient, so it's given by uh, the integral right, of the signal right, times e to the j uh, kind of omega t dt. Right? And when I take the complex conjugate, uh, I have to take the complex conjugate of the signal and the complex conjugate of e to the uh, minus j omega, right? So if you uh, refer back here, Let's say you know that when I take the, the Fourier series to find the Fourier coefficients, I have e to the minus j omega. And so taking the complex conjugate gives me the plus there. But now I can just use the standard tricks that we've used. I can pull this linear part out of the expected value, put the expected value inside, and just apply it to the x part of it. So I get that. And then I say, well, what is this thing here? Right. Well, in order to find this thing here, I can just... Um, do what I did before, uh, except replace this x of k by the Fourier equation. And then, again, pull the, the integral and the multiplications outside, and I apply the expected value only to uh, the part that includes x. Right, and now I have the original signal here uh, times its complex conjugate evaluated at u and t. Right, but the expected value of that is just the com the sorry the autocorrelation, right? and the autocorrelation is uh, evaluated at the time difference u minus t. But now I know that uh, this is a periodic function, right? and so when I do this thing, I should get a Fourier coefficient right, evaluated at the frequency, you know, the discrete frequency index k. Right? So I should get a sub k, right? except for the fact that if you go back here, uh, the a sub k needed this t here and this t here to be the same. Right? But in fact, here I have the u here, which is the, kind of the analog of u. And I have this thing inside here, which is u minus t. Right? So these, this thing here and this thing are not the same. But um, this is just a shifted version of the autocorrelation, and so by the Fourier shift theorem, I should just get a sub k times e to the minus j omega times the shift, uh, which is t, right? Okay, so this final step here is just Fourier shift theorem. 
Okay, so now what I can do is say, well, my previous result says that this is equal to uh, the Fourier coefficient shifted in phase. So this bottom equation here uh, is this one here. And then the top equation uh, was this one here, which is given by this one here. Now what I can do is I can just take this uh, and substitute it with this. So I put that in there. Now this is an integral over t, so I can actually take the a sub k outside. Right? And now what I have is the integral of a complex exponential uh, times another complex exponential. And so you know this is going to be oscillating, and this is going to be oscillating. So on average, you know that oscillation is going to have um, average value zero, right? And actually, if I multiply these two things together, uh, then I'm just going to get another complex exponential with frequency which is equal to uh, the um, k minus m, right? So because I have a minus sign here or m minus k, it doesn't really matter, right? And so the frequency there will just be k minus m, and so that's going to generally oscillate and have average value zero unless uh, k minus m is equal to zero, right? In that case, then the frequency is zero, right, which is just a constant, and so that will integrate uh, here the, the, the limits of integration here from zero to big T. So that will integrate to T, and then when I divide by uh, T, I get one, right? So this thing here will generally be equal to zero unless k is equal to m, in which case the integral is to, uh, integrates to one, and then when I multiply by a sub k, I just get a sub k like, times this. So this um, this delta function here is the discrete time delta. Right. So it's equal to 1 if these guys are, uh, if k minus m is equal to 0 and 0 otherwise. Okay, so now uh, this is what shows you then that these things are orthogonal uh, if k and m are not equal to each other, right? Because then the expected value of their product uh, is equal to 0. Furthermore, if I look at when k is equal to m, right, so then what that means then is that if I have expected value expected value of x sub k the, magnitude, the squared magnitude of x sub k right? Uh, because x of k times this complex conjugate, then all I get is, well, k is equal to m. In that case, this is 1, and I get a sub k, right? So if uh, everything is 0 mean, right, then you'd expect that uh, this, the, the coefficients here to have uh, 0 mean, and uh, the expected value of this thing squared is just the same as the variance, right? So a sub k, then, uh, is the variance of the x of k. It's kind of telling you the size, the average size of that Fourier coefficient, right? Uh, where this, remember, this thing is con is complex, right? So the average uh, size is kind of like the average length or the distance from uh, the origin in the complex plane, the square distance. And so the final thing we have to prove then is that uh, the Fourier series, you know, that that equation, the Fourier series equation, is actually Correct, right? So here we took this thing and we said, well, I mean, if you just apply the um, apply the uh, regular deterministic Fourier series, we can kind of mathematically do this thing, right? And these two things should be equal to each other, but you know, because this is random, we uh, we have to kind of establish that that's actually true, uh, so that uh, this thing and this thing are actually equal to each other. Um, even if x of t is random. And so we're going to do that because that actually might not always be true. Uh, we're going to do that by uh, establishing equality in the mean square sense. Right? So what we want to say is that, well, this minus this thing squared uh, 
this minus this thing squared uh, is equal to zero. So let's take a look at that. So this is the kind of thing here that we want to uh, prove is equal to zero, right? X of t minus the Fourier series expansion uh, quantity squared. And remember, uh, some of these terms here are complex, so we're going to kind of just, you know, this thing in general will be real, but we're just going to multiply it by its uh, complex conjugate. So uh, remember from the previous proof, we have these two things uh, right here. And what we're going to do is we're just going to substitute those into the expansion of this, right? So when I take this thing and I expand it out, uh, I expand the square first and then apply expectation. So I get the expected value of the first term here squared, right? Minus uh, the expected value of this times this, right? And then I move the expected value inside. So I get the expected value of x of t times the complex conjugate, x of k. And then it's instead of a plus sign here, I get a minus sign here. Uh, time uh, minus the expected value of uh, the complex conjugate of this times this, right, which is x star, right, times, or sorry, plus the expected value of this times this complex conjugate. Right? So when I get a sum times itself, I get a double sum, right, over uh, k and m, two dummy variables. And when I take the complex conjugate, I get x of k, x of k complex conjugate, and I get k and minus m over here. Right. So now I can look at each one of these guys individually. Right. This thing here right, is just the autocorrelation of x evaluated at the time shift 0. So this is the same as this. This thing here is just, according to uh, this, right? Or let's 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 first look at this one here. Uh, this one here, right? If I look at this one here, uh, these two are the same, right? Because all I've done is switch the order, right? And x complex conjugate t, right? And x of k. So this and this are the same. So if I take this, and say, well, look at this thing here. This is the same as a sub k times e to the minus j 2 pi k divided by t. Then I get this uh, canceling with this, right? You can see there. These two things are really the same. It's just that I get a plus sign here and a minus sign here. So when I multiply those two things together, I get one. Right? So this thing here is actually just a sub k. Right? So this term is the same as. Um, yeah, let's say this is a sub k, and so then I'm going to get, let's say, this term here, right? And then now this one, if I compare this one and this one, right, then you can see that really all I've done is taken the complex conjugate, right? And then so then this one would give me, again, the cancellation here uh, with this one here, because now when I take the complex conjugate, this would be positive. Uh, I would get a sub k complex conjugate, and so this one here gives me Uh, this one here, let's see here, sorry. This one here gives me this one, right? And then I get it the double sum here right, of uh, these guys right here. But now what I can do is I can say, well, look, this is the same as this, right? So then therefore, this thing here is a sub k times delta of k minus m. And so this is going to be
this term here is going to be 0 everywhere, right, except for when k is equal to m. Right? So if I do the summation over m, right, this is going to be 0. It's going to knock out most of the terms except for those where k uh, is equal to m. Right? And so when k is equal to m, then I get that this thing here is just 1. Right? And so then I'm just going to get a sub k. Right? So if I sum this whole thing over m, And this whole thing here is just a sub k. And then I just get a final sum from k is equal to minus infinity to infinity of a sub k. So I get this. And so now what I can do is I can say, well, if I look at this, and let's say this, uh, these two things are the same, so I can cancel these two. Then I'm left with this one here. Uh, and this one here, but now I can note that, well, the a sub k's are going to be real because of the fact that the a sub k's are the Fourier expansion of the autocorrelation function, right? So this is the Fourier expansion of the autocorrelation function, um, and the autocorrelation function I know is even, right? So this is really going to be expressed as the sum of a bunch of cosine terms, right? And so, therefore, uh, that these are going to knock out any of the complex coefficients due to the sign. Right? So the a sub k's are real. Uh, so this is the same thing as uh, a sub k. And then, well, this is just the sum of all the frequency components right? from minus infinity up to infinity. And so the sum of all the frequency components uh, is just the first value of the, the function that it's expanding, which is rx of 0. Right? So these two things are the same. Uh, and so then this, is, uh, this minus that is equal to 0. And so the whole thing is then equal to 0. And that proves uh, the mean square equality. Okay? And so now what we're going to do moving forward in the next part of the lecture is uh, look at the case when uh, the function here, x of t, is not real. I'm sorry, it's not periodic.